Hello and welcome to the channel today. We're going to talk about Bjorn, the Viking that can do automatic vulnerability scanning on your network. So in the prior video, I talked about what it was, what it is. In this video, we're going to try and install it on the devices that I just received from Amazon. I got my WaveShare version 4 screen and I got my Raspberry Pi Zero W with um, the header all put on the board. It's already soldered um, onto the board, so I'm really happy for that. If you cannot get it with the header on already, you can buy the header separately and then you can solder it on the Raspberry Pi zero yourself if you know how to do that okay so you also need to have some sort of converter to be able to read you know the micro sd card which is in this already it's just some micro sd card i has lying around now what we need to do now is to first of all install a standard os raspberry pi os on the micro sd card then we're gonna put that micro sd card into the Raspberry Pi and we're gonna put the wave share screen on the top of that Raspberry Pi and then I'm gonna show you a really really nice 3d printed glow-in-the-dark case I have for this device now I have no battery for it like we already know that the Ponagotchi device the big one here I got the Pi sugar inside of this this is a pretty thick one compared to uh, the other case I'm printing. So first things first. Now we're going to go ahead and download the Raspberry Pi Imager. This is the program I've opened right here. You can go ahead and find it on the raspberrypi.com slash software. You're going to find the links down below in the description. Go ahead and download the version for, just scroll down a bit, for Windows, Mac OS X or Ubuntu. When you have it installed, plug in the micro SD card into a computer. And I'm going to pick the device. The device is going to be, if you have the same device as I have, scroll down and find the Raspberry Pi Zero, the one right there with the Zero W or Zero WH. If you bought the Raspberry Pi Zero 2, there's another option right there. You can go ahead and pick that. Now, since we picked the one called Raspberry Pi Zero, the one I bought from Amazon, this is one I'm going to pick. Operating system is going to be a light version because we're running a Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, which is kind of low in system power and doesn't really have a lot of RAM or processing power. So go ahead and pick the one called Raspberry Pi OS Other. And now we're going to go ahead and pick a light version. Now, to my attention, when I just looked before, I noticed that the one that is uh, the Beyond is compiled with, and we're going to go ahead and check out the website, is the version called 24.10.22. And just to pay attention to that, it does say that the one now is called legacy version. And the other one, which is the newer compiled version, is the one called 241119. Now, I'm going to go ahead and try that just for the sake of this video. So I'm going to pick the Raspberry Pi OS Lite 32-bit. Pay attention to it. It's the one that is like around a half gigabyte. Uh, not the one 2.7, which is a full OS. This is going to be the light version. So pick the light version. I know I'm picking the wrong version, 2024, 11, 19, but we have to try it for the sake of this video. Go ahead and pick the storage. It's going to be the one right there. And if it's, uh, depending on whether the SD card is formatted or not, it can make things pop up and stuff on the screen. Go ahead and click next now. Now, when you actually uh, do this and you burn down or you write the OS to the SD card, you're going to go ahead and click edit settings. And now you can go ahead and put down some very interesting information to so set the host name. Now, I think it was the point of setting the host name and it also username and host name set to beyond. So just go ahead and do that. So I'm just following the installation guard right there. So beyond. And there we go. The password itself is uh, should be the same as Bjorn, so I'm gonna do nothing to that. 
configure wireless LAN, and this is important because you would need to make sure it can actually connect to your Wi-Fi network at home so you have internet on it when you turn it on. So go ahead and type in your SSID and your password. It's going to be your name of your Wi-Fi network and the password of your Wi-Fi network. The other thing here down below is whatever you would like to do. Uh, for the sake of this video, I'm not going to show you I'm typing this, so I'm going to leave it there now. On the services, uh, it's always a good idea to say, well, use password authentication, enable SSH. If you want to do it, you can also allow public key authentication, but I'm going to not do that, but we're going to enable SSH. The other options, um, up to you, I guess. So go ahead and now click save and after that, we're going to go ahead and say, would you like to apply the custom settings? I say yes. And now all existing data is going to be deleted and just say yes. And now it is being written on the SD card. And this is just a waiting time. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and get back when it's done. So we see now that it's written done. It says the Raspberry Pi OS Lite. So the bit was written on the mass storage device. Now you can remove it, click continue, and then basically you can just close the program. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Now, while we were talking, I went ahead and printed myself the small case right here. It is actually glowing in the dark. And to illustrate that, I'm gonna show you that with a light turned down. As you can see, it is clearly glowing in the dark. A little hard to see maybe because the screen of my monitor is actually glowing. It's a small case. I'm going to turn the light on again. The case itself is just a small Raspberry Pi case. It will fit the version 4 screen with a lid on the top. I found the casing on Thingiverse. Go ahead and check it out. It's also in the description below. What I'm going to go ahead and do now is to remove the mini USB from the computer. Take it out of the converter, whatever you have. And of course, my converter have a small hat. So put it on. Now we're going to go ahead and put the micro SD card into the Raspberry Pi unit, which I have right there. Now on the Raspberry Pi unit, there's only one place it can go, and it is in the front, as you can see right there. Go ahead and put it in. Only one way to go in. I'm just gonna take a look right there. So put it in and just give it a small dip. There we go. That's gonna be no click, no diggle dig or any sound. It's just gonna go right into the Raspberry Pi Zero. Now, what you're gonna do is to take your wave share screen. And this is important now because when we're gonna go ahead and start this up, installation process will actually ask you about different kind of questions. Scrolling down a bit here to the installation, I think, uh, no, there's no screen of it, but we're going to go ahead and follow these here. And I think, I think, yeah, at the moment, the paper screen two and four has been tested and implemented. So, but I do know that through the installation, it, it will ask you which kind of wave share screen you have. Version one, two, three, and four, I think you can choose and have the version four. Now you can see that when you take your wave share screen just like this and you flip it boop, like that, there's a small um, sticker just right there, right? And it says version four. I hope you can see that. And this is exactly the one we need. Now, there is a screen protector on it, and you can go ahead and take it off if you want to do that. I'm not going to do it. I already told you that the Raspberry Pi Zero comes with mine with a soldered, um, uh, what are you going to call it, header on. And you can go ahead and buy it with or without the header and sort it yourself. Now, the way you're going to go ahead and plug this together is basically just to, well, the sticks go into the holes on the wave share screen and the sticks right here, what I'm going to call it, the legs. And you're going to make sure they fit and 
they all have connected to the hole. You just give it like a small gently click. There we go, and I want more. And it should look something like this. They're not totally in, uh, but it's definitely something you can see that it's close enough. What you're gonna do now is to go ahead and take your USB cable. Uh, this is <laughs> USB C. Uh, I don't know. It's not C, but the micro USB. Uh, so what you're gonna go ahead and is to plug it into the one that is the outermost right there. So I'm gonna plug it in so you can see it. So the outermost, that one, the outermost, right? So the one you will have left is the innermost USB. And now we're gonna go ahead and plug it into your computer and just wait a bit and it will boot up. Now, depending on how long and what kind of version you have, it can take a little longer time for it to boot up and you will see that it's starting to turn on. I have a difficulty showing you because it's the cord's not long enough, but you can see it's actually blinking red uh, lights and green lights. I think it's actually just a green light blinking right now. And what you then eventually will see is this device popping up in your network on your Wi-Fi router if you typed the password and the username correctly. What you're gonna do in order to be connected to the Raspberry Pi on the OS we've just installed on it, you need to download a program called Putty. Well, there are many different kinds of programs you can use, of course, but Putty is the most easy, most widespread SSH connectable program. You can download from the webpage right here, putty.org. I also put the link in the description below for you to click on. Now, also, Putty looks like this, and it's um, very simple to use. This is how it starts up, this is how it looks. It already starts in port 22. So what you need to do when the Raspberry Pi is booted up is to actually find the IP address of your Raspberry Pi. Now, if you have issues with finding the IP address, which is pretty easy if you have access to your Wi-Fi router at home, you just access that and see which kind of IP addresses is given out to different kind of connect clients. And it should be named Bjorn as we named it as during the installation from the Raspberry Pi imager, as we remember just before. The IP address is then going to be typed in here at the, as the host name. And then you basically just press open. Now, if some weird reason the settings is not exactly it is on my screen right now, it is an SSH, it's default connected like that, or chosen as a SSH connection. Just press open after that and put in the username and the password, which is Bjorn, one more time, Bjorn, because you put it in on the, during the installation on the Raspberry Pi. After that, we are ready to do our manual installation of Bjorn and the commands is on the Bjorn GitHub repository, which we're going to do just after this video. So now that we have successfully found the IP address of the Bjorn Raspberry Pi on network, it is time for us to install Bjorn on Raspberry Pi. So I pull up Putty here right now, and I put in the IP address of the Bjorn unit on my network. Um, remember to have it on port 22 and marked as SSH. Click open. Mine popped up like this. If it's the first time you connect to it, it will ask you about some sort of, you know, verification of a handshake or also something like that, you know, with you answer yes, of course to trust it or to accept it. I type in Bjorn now as the username and the password. And I know it's a bit small, so I'm gonna try and zoom a bit on it by going to, let's see, not full screen, change settings. So now that I successfully zoomed a bit on it, we can go ahead and insert the different kind of commands to install Bjorn on the Raspberry Pi. 
on the installation page here on the GitHub Infinition Beyond, you will see the command here. It's going to wget something from this URL right here. It's an SH script that's going to install Beyond. So let's go ahead and copy this. And basically just, I can right click. Maybe you have to do some other way to insert and press enter. It shouldn't take that long. The next step here can take a bit longer because it's the actual installation. So you go ahead and just copy paste this and go back and insert it like this and press enter. Now, this can of course take a bit of time. So pay attention to what I do right now and follow the exact same steps. What you're gonna do is usually the best idea is to do what I call a full installation. I haven't really thought about doing custom installations because that's where things doesn't work out of the box. So feel free to do that, but this video, I'm only covering the full installation. I choose option number one, full installation, the one recommended. Now it's very important to remember what I talked about earlier in the video, the version of the uh, screen we have on the Raspberry Pi. Mine is version four, so that's gonna be the V4 it's going to be option four, so I'm going to go ahead and pick four. If you have another version, two, three, or four, I'd say it is going to be version one. I don't know exactly what this is, but it's it's a different version. If you have this uh, identifier right there, then you can probably search it out. I got the WaveShare one, version four, so I pick option four. And now the installation process is here, and if you see some errors or... Uh, warnings of some sort in yellow. Most likely you can just ignore it because it's a Raspberry Pi Zero. It's very underpowered unit. So it does say, you know, right here, oops, Raspberry Pi Zero detected, all compatibility, compatibility checks passed. So we are really happy. So it does say the RAM is available and this space passed and the OS version check passed. So it seems like even though we got a slightly newer version, compiled version of the OS Raspberry Pi than the one they recommend here, which is the version of 24.10.22. We got a, a slightly you know, older version uh, from November. So it seems like a newer version it's called, sorry. So I guess, you know, we're gonna be fine. While this is installing, you can of course follow it on the screen. It's gonna be a bit tedious to look at because mine is not the biggest screen in the world. I haven't, you know, stretch it out. If you do that, right now it doesn't really do anything great. So uh, you can of course follow it and see what's going on, but you know, it's not that fun. So when we get back, we're gonna be done with installation. I'm gonna talk about what to do then. So it is actually done now installing. It took some time, you know, I, I didn't time it, but as you can see, it's gonna to get to this part here where it uh, wants to ask you a question. It says like, it's uh, if configuring Windows PC for USB gadget connection, then we can set some static IP addresses for default gateways and stuff like that. It's probably not a bad idea to just copy paste this. Um, and, and, and save it as what you want to do. Web interface will be available on the device IP address, which is the one we found already and connected to through PuTTY. And it just says, make sure the ePaper hat is properly connected. Uh, so we write reboot and I pressed on the bottom of my mouse, but you can just basically type reboot and that should definitely reboot our system. Uh, so let's do a sudo in front of it. That should definitely reboot the system, yeah. So we are losing the connection and Bjorn is rebooting. And if everything is going right right now, you know, we should definitely get some action on the screen on Bjorn on the WaveShare display. So now that we have successfully installed Bjorn and rebooted it, I took the liberty to let some time pass. And that time, and you can see it on the video right now, I'm running a just pre-recording of Beyond running on the Raspberry Pi Zero. As you can see, the interface is exactly the same as the one we have here down below. I'm gonna zoom out a bit so you can see it all. So there is an interface of a Viking down below with some different signs. And the different signs, as you can see, you can definitely read what they mean. 
The very first one here with the uh, arrow bullseye is the number of IP tags detected on the current network. And the board, the next one is it says 20 is the number of open ports detected, so it's the accumulated number on the network we are currently on. Number of vulnerabilities, and the next one is total number of cracked credentials. And then there is number of zombified machines with persistence. And nine, total numbers of stolen files. So there's an overview here of what it pwned, found on the network, and so on. All right, so I also took liberty to just briefly access the web interface, which is found on the IP address on port 8000. So go ahead and add the colon and the 8000 after it. Basically just do that, press enter, and it will take you to this web page right here. If you press the off button, it's gonna go off. If you press on, it's on. And then there is a status message here saying that, well, no such file directory, some log file. So there is some sort of log file not there. We can try and press it again. And it seems like that now, if it's not duplicated, I guess, it probably because it works now, I don't know. Then if you're gonna go ahead and access manual mode, then you can go ahead and do stuff manually. I'm gonna not go too much into the interface right now because I promised another video where I talk about the interface of Bjorn. But just quickly hovering, there are some options here we can go through um, and some different kind of, you know, uh, images popping out and, and this is a menu we can use. So it is definitely created like as a Viking adventure UI. I, this looks like loot in some way. It says loot. And clicking this, you know, we should definitely see what we found. Loot is another word for saying whatever we found and extracted from the network. So this is Bjorn running, you know, and this is our cyber Viking. Let's just talk about what this is all about and what we can do with it. Basically, it's let you um, do some network scanning, identify live hosts and open ports. So we've got some reconnaissance going on. Vulnerability assessment perform vulnerability scans using Nmap and other tools. So it definitely use popular tools to discover different kind of vulnerabilities. Now, of course, all this is only as good as Nmap is. Nmap is not really the best vulnerability scanner, if you ask me. It could be bigger tools like Nessus and so, but that's never going to run on a Raspberry Pi Zero. So just having Nmap at our hand, you know, in a handheld small device that can be used to basically do whatever. And we can create our own modules, you know, just remember, make them lightweight. It conduct different kind of brute force checks on various services. So if you are on a network with really bad credentials and stuff, you can just take this device to your work and say, do you allow me to do a automatic pen test with someone, you know, some device that is underpowered and cannot do much, but it can do something and say yes. Then you can basically show that, oh, you have bad passwords, credentials, stuff like that. And then you can start extracting files from vulnerable services. And there's actually a real real time display. And now the cord I have it connected to is um, looking at it right now. It's gonna be a bit difficult for me to show it because it's not long enough for the camera. But it definitely, you know, changes this uh, Viking right here. It, it does different things, you know, and the horns are moving up and down. Looks quite funny, I guess. Um, right now it got glasses on, something like this. And, you know, I really look forward to talking about the actual interface so yeah definitely definitely gonna look more into this and i hope that you like thinking about these fancy raspberry pi vulnerability things going on i know this is a different thing you know compared to just having some like a ponagachi which is also really fun more specialized unit where this is actually more like a unit that is you know something we use for, you know, a little bit of scanning and stuff like that. Now, I want to show you exactly the last product step there is. And I did 3D print the casing and I want to show one more time. I have the casing right here. So what we're going to do now is take the Bjorn and disconnect it. I know it's going to go offline, but just as the way it is. And now that I did that, 
since this is a ink display, it's gonna stay like this on the ink display, as you can see. Um, this is the last recording of it. And there are some numbers. Well, my network is probably pretty secure, so it couldn't find anything specially. Um, but it's level 16 now. So what we're gonna do now is to take a 3 penny case and basically just look at how it's orientated and say like, yeah, so we're gonna put it down in a way so that it slides in. Let me just see if I can get quickly get it there. So we're gonna take out the USB card first, and sorry, the SD card and slide it in so you have it like this and then basically slide the SD card back in. The only thing you need to do now is just to take the, the top lid from the 3D penny case, orientate it correctly and just put in the top of the box and just closed. And there you have it, your own 3D printed minus glow in the dark case for Bjorn. So now that we successfully installed Bjorn on Raspberry Pi and we tested it out just to see if it works or not and everything was fine, we understand now that installing automatic vulnerability scanners on small Raspberry Pis isn't that difficult, even though that it sounds like a lot of work. You know, I would like to say that the, the guy behind it, let's give him some thumbs up right now and definitely go ahead and give the guy a like, comment, you know, follow his work, something like that. Mention him in different kind of places, you know, buy him some coffee, whatever you're gonna do. Um, looking at the amount of work he put into this is incredible. Uh, he also created something called a Beyond Detector, which is uh, something that can detect the IP address of Beyond on your unit, if so that you cannot find it in your own router. So going back to the original state of this, you know, we are seeing commits to it, like that is last week. Um, we are very interested to see how this can be developed into having more modules that it can actually make take action on some of the things or is it just a pure vulnerability scanner? What can this be? What can it become beyond the cyber viking? You know, it's very, I think it's very fun, you know, fun project. I, I really love these kind of projects. We have, we see them on GitHub. We see them on, it's like a, a private people, you know, coming out of, you know, <laughs> the dark cave and saying, oh, look what I developed, you know, and we're finding things like this. Also, there is a usage example on how to Bjorn autonomously hunt down your network like a Viking Raider. Fake demo for illustrations. This is, of course, how it looks. Uh, so there is some sort of reconnaissance, or re reconnaissance sorry, phase where you discover a live host. That's what I talked about before by using an nmap as a range scan and find some different ports open and a MAC address. And then it can find vulnerabilities on these different kind. And now it's the vulnerability on 3306. That's a user enumeration on a MySQL server. And some SMB on 445. That's going to be Eternal Brew candidate. So there are many different interesting things. And it can also crack and extract different kind of things. So we are looking into units that can be potentially dangerous to have on your network. If you choose to do these kind of things on your own private network, please be aware that, well, if you have something that is insecure, Bjorn is going to find it, probably going to find it for you. And whether it can, you know, hack it or not, I'm not really sure. But, you know, I see this as um, a very interesting thing. It is like it's designed for community-driven weapon forge, create and share your own attack modules. And I definitely think that we we can see things for this in the future being, you know, um, developed and tested. And I would very much like to see that, you know, some of you guys 
contribute to this project if this is what you can do and show what this is all about. Now, I'm emphasizing this is a pure ethical, you know, apparatus you are creating. So please pay attention to that it is illegal to connect this device to an actual real network that you do not have the authorization to do so. So please make sure to have the authorization to connect it to a foreign network because it's actually going to do some stuff that is you know attacking stuff you know and and this is this is where it 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 is a different thing compared to just having discovery and reconnaissance only this is more than that this is also attacking and extracting and so on so I want to say um, I'm going to create another video uh, about this where I will cover the web interface on Bjorn. I will talk about it in the best detail that I can. I'm going to go through it and I will try and see if I can find a way to, you know, it could be really fun to hook it up against some tri hack me bot or something like that. But that would only require it to be, you know, hooked up to the OpenB pin and then that's really it, you know. But the problem is if we hooked up an OpenB pin, we would have to manually control Bjorn from the web interface because we can, we can, if you just you know let it stay there, it will do active reconnaissance of the whole network on the open VPN network that we're getting access to, and that can be more than one IP address open to us. So we don't want to. And this is exactly why I'm saying it can be quite dangerous devices. Actually, um, I would say depending on depending on which kind of vulnerabilities and modules you're going to put into this, this can be more or less destructive or discovering only or a testing device. You only need to test default credentials and stuff like that. Having it just run for a day or two doesn't really matter because it's such a small device. So it can target, kind of takes away some of the work you're going to do. You can just have it running in your own company and say, well, I'm going to only enable or remove some of the modules and attack. So let's find out in the next video how much we can control from the web interface on Bjorn. And I really hope that you learned something for this video and you want to create this device. I, I actually found it quite fun, you know, and also remember to, you know, leave some comment below if you have anything on your heart you want to say about this device. Is it something you could, you know, have an interest in creating? Um, so let me know what you think. And if you like the video again, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you like the video. Leave a comment, you know, and that's going to be great. So thank you for watching and have a really nice day.